Young Suk Kim, thank you for coming in today to talk uh, with uh, with me about uh, your work. Yeah. And uh, I thought uh, a good place to start might be um, uh, discussing your motivations for coming to UCI. You came mm -hmm. to UCI mm -hmm. just about the same time as I did. Right, uh, that's true. <laughs> what, uh, yes. what, what encouraged you to make that jump? Um, so I was in Florida for quite some time. Um, that was actually a very good place for my initial growth. But I found UCI to be a really exciting, growing place. Um, I saw the faculty here. Um, they're really national, international experts in various fields. And we know education uh, by nature is cross-disciplinary, right? We, we recognize that. but. If you look at schools of education in the country, um, it's, you know, schools of education, kind of there are good, you know, pockets of schools who have really cross-disciplinary team, um, but that's actually somewhat few, and I think I found UCI to be the case. Truly cross-disciplinary with expertise in almost all, all aspects that matter to education, right? So policy aspects, political, economic, and also uh, psychology, right? Cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, and also looking at teacher training. So all these different pieces were here. Um, and in, and mm -hmm. in Florida, um, it was really specialized around that reading, s right. reading center, right? Right, so I had joint appointment with the College of Education and Florida Center for Reading Research. Um, so Florida Center for Reading Research is a very uh, well-known kind of leading um, um, research institute in the field of literacy, and that was a really good place for me. Um, but you know, to address the problem as you know, education problems or controversies, we need to expand a lot of it because literacy is one piece of it. So I f thought that as I, you know, as my uh, research minds were expanding. I thought this was a great place to continue to grow and expand and actually to partner with people um, that I would not have been able to otherwise. Yeah, and your work mm -hmm. in particular mm -hmm. uh, seems to be well placed here because it's uh, so much of it is about integrating mm -hmm. uh, different uh, approaches to right. uh, reading and writing. Yeah. Uh, can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. Um, so I study reading, kids reading, language, and writing development, and along with it comes cognition, right? So, um, what I, so what has been happening in the field? So reading and writing have been studied in multiple fields, in psychology, education, speech, language, pathology, and policy, all different you know, uh, disciplines. And in the last four or five decades, it's been really active um, in terms of research. But what's been happening is that, so people look at reading and writing in a certain way in different fields. Even within the same field, people look at one part of reading or one part of writing, and they just go deep. And that's great. It has uh, revealed really a rich understanding about what's involved in reading and writing. Um, but somehow, somewhat of a byproduct of that is that then there are many pieces in uh, across the field, and they have not been put together. So I felt that things were kind of uh, scattered and piecemeal and somewhat confusing, especially when I came into the field as a doc student. What are all these different pieces? Right? People use different terms. But that's kind of very superficial beyond using uh, different um, terms for the same construct. There are different pieces that were not put together, and there have been competing models and kind of somewhat different evidences, and it was just confusing. And I thought that, you know, we need to have a very organized understanding about uh, what it takes to develop in reading and writing. Pieces were there, they were just not put together and have been examined together. It has not been that, that way. So in the kind of earlier years of my kind of a career, I looked at different pieces. And I think last three, four years, I've been looking at, okay, let's look at them together. And how do they converge, right? Different competing models, do they converge? Do they diverge? Um, if also that's the case, if they converge, what are the mechanisms, right? So there are, say, 
there are 10, at least various, you know, identified pieces that work together for reading developments. Then do they all independently relate to reading or do they work together to contribute to reading development, mm -hmm. right? So looking at that mechanism. And these are elements like, um, things like memory, attention, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, I mean, reading is, um, it involves really complex processes, right? It involves language skills, uh, it involves cognition, it involves uh, print-related skills. So when we don't think about cognition, so memory, right? So when we read written text or when we produce written, produce written text, right? So we have to hold information, linguistic information, and then update, right, constantly process it. That's working memory, right? Also, we need to have attention, right? So we have conversation right now. There are other kind of uh, maybe distracting stimuli. I need to still pay attention to your question, for example, right? right. That's attention. That's also cognition. There's also language, you know, for us to continue this conversation or, or even read something and understand it. We need to have an understanding of words, vocabulary. We need to have an understanding of syntax, right? How words combine and produce different meaning. We also have an uh, understanding called the high order thinking skills, right? So making inferences. Um, a lot of times, important messages or meanings are left out, not explicitly said. Then as a reader, I have to infer that information, right? That's kind of a high order skill. We need to also have background knowledge. If we talk about plants, I need to know, if I know something about plants, it works much better for my understanding. Right? So there are really multiple pieces influencing uh, reading and writing development. Then how do they work together, right? So. Um, one example that has been confusing, I guess, in a way, so at least it has been inconsistent in the field, is the role of working memory in reading comprehension. So theoretically, it makes sense to have working memory in the uh, reading comprehension, and there's been empirical evidence about it. But studies have also said, well, the relation of working memory to reading comprehension is spurious, it's, it's not real. Uh, what they did in some studies was, Okay, let's have working memory, and let's also have uh, vocabulary. Let's also have inference or some other things. When we all put them together, what happens? Which one survives, <laughs> basically, in the statistical model? And they found that working memory does not. And they said, well, uh, the working memory is not really important. What they missed is that uh, working memory is important for vocabulary. Working memory is important for inference. So the influence of working memory on ultimate outcome reading comprehension, for example, is really through vocabulary, inference making, and other pieces, right? So without understanding this kind of indirect ways of some things influence reading comprehension, for example, or writing, people have a misunderstanding things. Mm -hmm. So putting these things together in a structure and empirically validating it, I thought, really is important um, for the field, um, for the field of researchers, also for practitioners. So, uh, so when you talk about practitioners, mm -hmm. uh, the relevance of this to practitioners, I know a lot of your work is about designing interventions. Right. So, uh, what are some of the implications mm -hmm. of this kind of? Uh, more integrated thinking mm -hmm. uh, about uh, reading and writing for the interventions that are being designed for schools. Right. So that means there are mechanisms, right? As many things are related to each other and building upon, right? So some things are built upon, well, higher order skills are built upon lower level skills. And those higher level skills also are important for even higher level skills, right? Then, as practitioners, you know, um, we need to pay attention to building the foundations and then move up to the next level and then right to the highest level. So our ultimate goal, so called say reading comprehension and written composition, to get there, we need to address all these simultaneously, but in a very systematic way so that we build solid foundations first and then because they have trickle down or cascading effects on t to the kind of ultimate goal outcomes. Great, great, and and the interventions I know are also mm -hmm. important because part of what uh, uh, what you were recruited for here at UCI is this 
high impact cluster mm -hmm. where we've we've hired now right. s five six seven right. faculty to focus on interventions to address right. uh, uh, poverty uh -huh. and uh, educational expand educational opportunity right so uh, can you speak a little bit about that cluster mm -hmm. and your 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 involvement as in, mm -hmm. in terms of senior leadership for that uh, right. that group that's emerging here on campus yeah so actually I forgot to mention that as part of kind of a draw or attraction to UCI so high impact higher my understanding it is that it's designed to create opportunities for um, you know learning opportunities for children especially from um, disadvantaged backgrounds so as I said before educational issues or controversies are very much multi-dimensional right and therefore we need to approach it from various vantage points so at um, a high impact higher initiative is really building a team of experts from different disciplines and you know with different training so myself and Carol Connor are coming from a somewhat similar, right? It's more of um, psychological developmental, psychological educational work. Uh, we also have uh, faculty members in sociology, right? So they come from a um, more sociological framework. We also have cognitive psychology or psychology faculty in that, um, with that expertise and also technology, right? Informatics. So, um, in terms, I mean, so I'm piece, I'm kind of a, in this kind of a, a team, I'm tackling a particular, a, a piece with a particular focus, more of, you know, classroom-based intervention. So I know how things, for example, how, you know, mechanisms of how things work among um, children. Therefore, I tackle, say, how to improve children's thinking skills, right? How to improve children's vocabulary. And then other people look at, you know, how can we um, uh, do that using technology? How can we do that from a broader scope, right? Uh, making a change in the school uh, infrastructure, right? So that's, I think, um, uh, where I come in and also what the whole team is, is designed to do. Yeah, and I know that that cluster uh, is working nationally and, and internationally, mm -hmm. but, uh, but in its local work, right. uh, we're in a setting where uh, so many uh, uh, students are uh, classified as English language learners mm -hmm. and bilingual education right. uh, by, uh, um, uh, is also very salient and significant. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you speak a little bit to that and kind of how your work intersects with that um, uh, uh, langu the language mm -hmm. um, uh, issues that are prominent here in Orange County? Yeah, um, UCI is located in a very um, kind of, in a, well, unique place in a way uh, because it really serves students, um, you know, diverse students truly in, a, in like a true sense of diversity. Um, students in terms of various economic backgrounds, linguistic backgrounds, and cultural backgrounds. Um, you know, one of my research lines um, is um, working with the bilingual children and, you know, understand their bilingual and biliteracy acquisition. Um, so, you know, so in that regard, this was a really great place for me. Um, so in that, you know, for that particular population, uh, we know it's really expanding population and it's expected that, you know, bilingual population is going to actually grow in the school settings, right? So we need to have really solid understanding about what's unique about you know this uh, particular population or what's similar about this population with other so-called you know monolingual children right? so if they bring in a lot of um, assets uh, let's uh, understand what assets they bring in if they have uh, th they also have challenges right so let's have a clear understanding about the challenges and figure out how to best um, serve them so I have, uh, we're just starting a project um, to address uh, just a piece of that question, to um, have an understanding about what it is really involved in un uh, re developing reading and writing for bilingual children. So there has been an idea called a transfer, right? And has been, that has been the main premise for a bilingual program. So the idea is that, you know, if I 
have developed skills in my first language, say it could be English, Spanish, or any language. When I learn things in second language or third language, I'm going to bring those skills and utilize those. It was a broad idea, has been really welcomed, but empirical evidence um, has been, in my opinion, limited. And we need to understand like what exactly so-called a transfer. If there, if things skills transfer, are they a positive transfer? Are they a negative transfer? If they are positive transfer, then the implication is that we need to promote those skills in the first language, right? And then help, and so that they it, it promotes their second language uh, learning. But if it is negative transfer, well, what is the best way to kind of minimize the negative impact? So we are trying to tease out those pieces in our new project. Yeah, and I think this integrative mm -hmm. framework that you have, mm -hmm. where you look, you look very carefully at these different elements, uh, mm. uh, executive function, right. attention, memory, yeah. syntax, vocabulary, right. you could really uh, get at which are the ones that potentially can transfer and which of them uh, it d doesn't logically make sense that they would uh, uh, development of language in one space mm -hmm. would transfer to the other. Absolutely. So we're trying to tease apart those different pieces, right? So, you know, memory attention are kind of a more of a so-called domain general. It applies to all types of learning. And it would influence children's first language learning, also second language learning, right? But also there are pieces that might be unique to specific language, right. right? It would not really readily transfer. So we need to have an understanding, but also, but our thinking skills. If I develop really high, or, you know, advanced thinking skills in my first language, would I use that? The speculation is yes, but exactly how and what has been unclear in the field. Right, and then yeah. potentially you could design uh, more specific interventions yeah. around the pieces that that aren't transferring well right. uh, to, to, uh, to address those. Absolutely, to, you know, the reason why we need to have a really solid understanding is to provide um, precise intervention that meets students' needs, right? So different uh, populations have their own specific needs. Of course, individuals also vary uh, in terms of their needs, but you know, by building an, our understanding about in general for this, say, subpopulation, what are their unique needs, and then how can we best meet their needs, right? So, yeah. So, one thing I'm uh, always curious about and ask, uh, like to ask faculty about is uh -huh. what, their in what their personal motivations were to get involved with th this particular line of educational research. Mm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your own story about yeah. uh, how you came to focus on educational research in general? Mm and this reading and writing right. uh, 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 work in particular? Sure. Um, so I was a teacher in elementary school and high school um, in San Francisco. And I was teaching in elementary school. I was teaching in a bilingual classroom context. And I found a pattern or patterns of learning so some group, well, the group of children, you know, seem to learn to read in the second language pretty quickly, whereas other kids seem to take much longer. And that seemed related to their first language skills, <laughs> right? I thought, hmm, that's intriguing. And, um, well, what is the best way to address these questions, right? How can I dig deeper? And for that, I needed to, um, you know, get training. So that's when I kind of started looking into PhD program. Um, I think of my own interest in language was perhaps because of my own language learning experience. Mm -hmm. So English is my second language. So, you know, of course I went through the whole phase of challenges <laughs> learning, you know, second language, you know, language that's drastically different from my first language. And, it took years to develop, and I understand the challenges of acquiring a language and what it means. So that's also, um, that I think it's a part of it. Um, another piece of, I guess, focusing on more of a literacy is my, I guess, um, I think there are several pieces to it. 
you know, when I was teaching, of course, in elementary school, that's a very important part of the learning, right? Acquiring, acquiring uh, the reading and writing skills. And, you know, there's huge variation among kids. Some kids really advance, and some kids are not. But when I was growing up, I had, in my same classroom, you know, when I was in elementary school, I had friends who could not read at the end of elementary school. And that, people thought that it was because they were not smart enough, so-called smart enough, because we didn't have a good understanding about how to teach reading or writing and what it takes to develop um, um, reading and writing. So I think a part of it, you know, of course, I, I, I did not know whether that was really, um, that played a role, but I think that was intrigued by that as well. Well, Young Suk, thanks so much for coming in and sharing oh, some you. of your your work with us and your ideas about uh, uh, doctoral training and, sure. and research. My pleasure. Yeah.